Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Archives of History Lecture Series. Uh, we have an outstanding uh, speaker with us this evening about a topic that looks like we have quite a bit of interest in, so we'll look forward to that. Uh, I do want to note a couple of other uh, upcoming events, upcoming lectures here in the Archives of History Library. Uh, on Thursday, February 26th, uh, our commissioner, Randall Reed Smith, will be uh, doing a presentation on opera in West Virginia. <clears throat> on Tuesday, March 3rd, we have Chris Saunders who will be talking about uh, the Underground Railroad. And on Thursday, March 19th, uh, Dr. Jane Spencer will be speaking on lobotomies, which sounds <laughs> but uh, it's a very interesting topic and he's just the man for it. Uh, this evening, as I said, our topic uh, is land grants, and that certainly is a uh, fascinating part of our history, as our speaker will, will tell us. Um, Russell Rawls, uh, Russ has lived his entire life in West Virginia. His paternal side of his family helped to settle Braxton County, and there's actually a, a town in Braxton County named after him. He attended Virginia Tech and the University of Charleston, graduating with a degree in history. Uh, he continued his education at Marshall University, where he obtained a master's in public administration. He is currently the deputy state auditor for the County Collections Division of the West Virginia State Auditor's Office. And in this capacity, he is responsible for the collection and enforcement of delinquent property taxes on real property in West Virginia. In addition, he is responsible for the distribution and collection of public utility taxes in the state. He has been with the State Auditor's Office since 1981. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker this evening, Russell Rollins. Thank you, Joe. Let me first begin by stating that I'm no expert on land grants. What I have learned was through my work with him early on in my career at the Auditor's Office I want to first take this opportunity to thank uh, Randall Reed Smith, Commissioner of the Division of Cultural and History, Randy Markham, historian Joe Geiger, Deborah, and uh, everyone else for inviting me here, and Jamie for inviting me to address you tonight. I'm sorry, only sorry that Randy's not able to come. As, as Joe said, I'm Russell Ross. I went to grad school. I wanted to work in government, I knew, so I majored in in public administration, got my master's, and immediately upon graduation, I took my first and really only job was with the State Auditor's Office, where I've been since 1981. As soon as I came in the land division of the Auditor's Office, which it was referred to then, I immediately became aware of the importance of land grants. At that time, our office had the responsibility of the land grants. There wasn't a day really that individuals, people, mostly at that point studying their uh, genealogical history, would come in our office to look at the land grants to see where their poor families came from. However, shortly after that, there was a, a court case, which I gave an example of it over there, called the Ross Sears versus Columbia Gas. This was a case that went on for years and years, and it showed me the importance of land grants because of property in Wayne County around the East Lynn Lake, people, they took the property that was currently on the land books then and took it all the way back to the land grants to see who actually owned the property. There's an example of William Hamm, who was at the time a local attorney, was retained by the uh, court system here to do a, essentially an abstract of mineral interests there, on which he, he did. He prepared a report, which ultimately decided that the property belonged to Columbia Gas. That case eventually ended up in the Supreme Court, where they still retained ownership of the property. No longer, as you are well aware of, no longer are the land grants stored in our office, in the auditor's office. We felt, felt several years ago that Undoubtedly, the best place to have it was over here in the archives and history section, where people could come in, look at it at their convenience, sit down at tables like this, and make them available. However, 
A lot of our records, we realize that some of the people cannot come into the auditor's office or come into here. We're making a lot of our land records available right now online. In the very near future, land books will be online, sales listings will be online, all sorts of records. Deeds will be online that we have in our office will be online now. Right now, presently, you can go on our website and view certain delinquent land records, whether it was sold to an individual at a sheriff's sale or whether it was certified the state for a future sale. You can follow through and look at records online right now for our office. The reason I'm bringing that up to attention is that you can go presently right now, you can go to the Virginia State Library's website and view land grants that were under the that were at one point in West Virginia, or were in Virginia now in West Virginia, you can visit them. And just out of curiosity, the other day, I did it and came across, um, let's see if I can find it here. Hello. Did you escape, Russ? No, it's down at the bottom. Okay. Okay, you can go in their online catalog to see, you know, if you, information, if you know your names you're looking for, you can go in there and select it, select your name, and you can also, uh, I know you, this is difficult to see from this site, but you can view the actual land grant that you're requesting. You can look at it, see it online right now, which is, a, which is very nice. Shortly, uh, hopefully, West Virginia State of West Virginia has that, right? Hopefully, we'll have that in the very near future. Can you uh, Yes, yeah. We're looking at that right now. The problem is, under our statutes right now, there's a provision that in order to in order to print it, there's a charge, and that's mandated in the state code. We're working under a system not only for that, for our other land records that we have to be able to charge that and still let people view it online. And there'd be essentially a printing charge that you could pay with a credit card or similar devices in order to allow you to do that. Right now, you can view a lot of our land records online, and in the future, it'll be even more. Also, as I said, there's several land grants I made available tonight for afterwards coming to look at, it, which I found extremely interesting. One was from the Governor James Monroe, a future president of the United States of Daniel Boone. I, why I picked Daniel Boone is that when I was a young youngster, I had a relative that was in the genealogical work. He discovered that our family re related to Daniel Boone, so naturally, I found that interesting that a lot of land grants around here was given to Daniel Boone. Another one is a former president, a future president of the United States, James Monroe, who was then governor of Virginia, gave the, gave the property to Daniel Boone. Also, Governor Benjamin Harrison, there's a land grant to the future president of the United States, George Washington, among what I brought here, which I found interesting. Also, um, Debbie, Deborah brought down a, the land grant book. I also brought down a Sims Index. There's also another book we have in the auditor's office that I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with, Making of a State by Edgar B. Sims. Sims is an important figure in our office because he was a former state auditor for many, many years. And while in the auditor's office, he compiled his staff to compare and compose the leading book on land grants. If you need to find a land grant, you know the county and the name, you can go to Sims Index and that will tell you where it is and what book to find it, which I found very, very useful when starting to work here.
prior to West Virginia becoming a state, as you well know, in 1863, all the records were in the land office in Virginia, included copies of patents and grants issued for vacant lands in West Virginia from, from the early 1600s. Uh, in 1606, King James I issued a charter to Sir Thomas Doyle and his associates incorporating them as the Virginia Company of London, which entitled them to settle land in the Western Hemisphere be between uh, 30 degrees latitude and 45 degrees north latitude, extending inland for 50 miles. Under the charter, they had all the lands within those bounds that can be granted by the king to such persons as the governing body might nominate. Uh, in the next year, what proved to be the first permanent settlement was created when they created Jamestown from the charter area. The, the charter was renewed in uh, 1609 and greatly increased the size of it to 200 miles north and south, going more toward the Pacific Ocean, which they, of course, didn't get. However, this section provided that those going to the New World would, <coughs> would receive 50 acres of land if purchasing shares in the company. And for that rate, they had to pay, pay 12 pounds, 10 shillings, and they would receive 100 acres of land. Um, excuse me, I lost. It. In 1634, due largely to the persistence of uh, Sir Thomas Hardy, he authorized the patent and lands on the basis of giving to the individuals who paid the transportation costs of the immigrants and not the settlers themselves the 50 acres of land. This new method they called the headright system. The first step in detaining the patent was to appear before a county court and present proof that a stated number of persons had been imported into the colony at their expense. Though the headright system was a prevalent method of land distribution during that 17th period, 17th century. However, there's another method authorized, though not utilized much, and after understanding the purpose of it, I understand why. In 1630, the council offered portions of land for persons who would settle in Indian territory. That means that if they settled there, they would get land. However, needless to say, settling Indian land at that point at that point, it's not, uh, not exactly the thing a lot of people wanted to do, risk their lives to settle for land. Uh, at, however, that, they made it enticing to those individuals because patents equal to four times the headright rate were being offered, but was not, needless to say, it was not met with great success. By 1715, the headright system all but ceased, replaced with a payment of five shillings, a certificate 50 acres was it issued. In 1705, Governor Spotsworth, Spotswood, pardon me, revised the whole land situation, in part proclaiming a prohibition on any persons receiving a single patent for more than 500 acres unless he owned five slaves. Also, there was a prohibition on patents exceeding, as I said earlier, the uh, acreage. And no, they, they have yet to find any statute repealing that. In 1776, the Virginia Revolutionary Council adopted the Constitution. The first land laws that were passed were brief and concerned territories along the uh, western waters. It wasn't until 1779 that a land office was created. Under this act, any persons could purchase as much vacant land as desired upon payment to the Treasury of a consideration of 40 pounds for each 100 acres desired. The warranties entered a claim to be the land he desired by depositing his warrant with the surveyor report. In addition to establishing the procedures of obtaining vacant land, the act provided for rewarding a land's promise as bounty for certain revolutionary war military service. No military service performed, however, after the Revolutionary War was rewarded by Virginia in the forms of lands, the state of Virginia in the forms of land. During the first year of operation, the land office was mainly concerned with using warrants for military bounty and satisfying claims originally under the colonial government. When Kentucky separated from Virginia to form a new state, the register was to uh, 
delivered to the Kentucky representative all original property papers regarding titles to lands in that state. When West Virginia became a state in 1863, Virginia was stripped of most of their uh, remaining vacant lands. And in 19, here's why I found very interesting Virginia. In 1924, apparently the head of the land department was a very powerful political figure over there because first time I've ever seen a law passed that the office would stay open, would remain a part of that government until the gentleman died. Once he died, it would revert back to the uh, a different department. Which, that's incredible to me, that being in government for as long as I have and being involved in politics for a while, that the man had that kind of juice, so to speak, to stay in power. But it, was, it wasn't until um, 1948 that apparently he died because in 1948, the records of the land office of Virginia was transferred to the state library where they are today. Records of land grants, that's, that's amazing to me still. The records of land grants in the state of Virginia are available, as I showed you, online. And you may ask, as I said earlier, you may ask why land grants are important today, and let's consider the influx of gas companies into this state, in particular in recent years, particularly in their goal to attain Marcellus and Utica gas wells throughout the state. I have been in many courthouses throughout this state in the recent three, four years where you almost have to take a, tip, a name or ticket to get in line to go in. They stay out all night waiting in line to be the first in line. I'm at Doddridge County, Tyler County, Wetzel, Marshall. And that's why these land records that we have in here, the land grants, are important because they take it back that far because Again, the Ross Sears case is a premier case of why land grants are important because of what that meant. They proved that the land grants were owned by Columbia Gas for that. Uh, as I said when I first started working here, that, that, that was a premier case, Ross Sears versus Columbia. As I said, Mr. William Hamm, a local attorney, was appointed by the district court to resolve all questions of ownership of two tracts of land. This land involved not only Mr. Ham, this case not only involved this Mr. Ham, but many other lawyers coming in our office research the question of ownership. It was eventually ruled that Columbia Gas owned the tracts, originally granted, originally, as I say, granted by the Commonwealth of Virginia 300 or 30,000 acres of Samuel Smith by a patent on June 29, 1797. And, and what happens during the year 1879, Columbia Transmission's predecessor, predecessors and title conveyed various portions of the Samuel Smith 31, it was 31,000 acres, the whole thing, land grants, including part of the question, 800 acres of surface conveyed by an A. Lowe to Samuel Ross, which included the acres involved in the court case. A. Lowe and, and, and his partners reserved the mineral interest, which was Asimov, his partner was Asimov. That 800 acres was the mineral interest which was resolved and stayed with the predecessors in title. So that's how that, and then further complicating the situation, there was what they referred to as the junior patents, which lied, which came about later on when taxes weren't paid on the senior patents, they were given away junior patents within that. However, in, 18, in 1874, there was what they call an injectment, injectment action taken by the predecessors in title, which was um, <coughs> under the Ross Sears case, under the subsequent James Coon under power of attorney for an Asimov, Asimov Lowe, who actually owned the mineral interests, executed the deed in question. This case, what, which started in 1975, did not end in 1992. And it directly, all this was directly tied to the Samuel Smith grant. And let me conclude, as I said earlier, I'm not an expert on it. I, I do know some things about current land books, current land records. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert some of these individuals in this fine office here that can assist you through, the, through your efforts. I do know how, 
do know how to find things, give me a name, and I can certainly find, find the land property on that. As I said earlier, a former state auditor, Edgar Sims, created the ultimate index of finding these land grants. They're not only the ones that are located, that were the Virginia grants, that are located in West Virginia, but the actual Virginia grants that were, uh, the West Virginia grants that were given after we became a state. Um, as I said earlier, the SIMS index. We also, I also brought a copy of the Making of a State, which is an excellent uh, device to look at records. I also, as I said many times tonight, I am not an expert, but I do know real estate, modern real estate, so to speak, and the delinquencies of that and how that relates to the, these records. Again, I want to thank Commissioner Reed Smith, Randy Markin, Deborah, Jamie, Joe Geiger there for inviting me to address you tonight. I hope I set some light on it. I'm probably not nearly as enough as I should, being a history major. If you have any questions, I can certainly try to answer some of them, or at least be able to put you in the right direction. Again, thank you for having me here tonight. Any questions? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Are land patents and land grants the same thing? Are they interchangeable? Because sometimes I hear that phrase. No. Uh, yes and no. Uh, let me, I'll give you the definition from the. The patent is an instrument from which the unappropriated land was conveyed by the governor to an individual. Um, the grant is. It seems the same the instrument by which an unappropriate land is conveyed by the state government to an individual. However, I believe that the, in order to get the patent, you had to go into the county clerk's office and stand in line and show, your, show the proof of it, which is the grant and the survey. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. I am, not, from, from my remembrance of grants, I don't recall seeing it within the land grants itself, the actual land grants. It came subsequent to that. I don't recall seeing any grants that said minerals versus surface. I mean, maybe Joe or Deborah or Jamie. Jamie right yeah, I don't recall ever seeing it. And quite honestly, West Virginia <coughs> is one state that does separate it. Some states, as I understand, do not separate the minerals from the land. Which certainly complicates situations when you do. So is there much, you mentioned when uh, the Virginia was granted land. Yeah. But then when West Virginia became a state, was there much land left there was Virginia what remains are vacant. I don't remember the acreage, it's certainly in, in here. Uh, I honestly don't, I, I don't recall how much because, oh yes ma'am, yes ma'am, there was some that were granted after 1863. I'm not sure the quantity of acreage in that quite honestly because we looked at the, I didn't look at that factor. Yes sir. The grant for patent land, I know the Revolutionary War they yeah. <coughs> no, they, it, it, according to this, according to all that I read on it, Revolution War, war they quit it. They quit rewarding. <coughs> Revolutionary War was the last one where they rewarded land, which I found interesting because I, I always thought that would be probably a way to entice people to join the military and go out. But it wasn't. Was it always government land or did that get some sort of portion of the land with the soldiers? Or? Well, there were certain companies that got sections of grants, and then they in turn gave, gave it or sold it to individuals themselves. So it's strictly up to the individuals. Because there was a, and Jamie did a lot of work on that, where the grant was given in one name, but there was a sign, it was three and four signees to that grant before it was 
finalize. No. How many years will it usually take after you've got the grant before you actually got the land? Well, it the, the set I think it was up to the individual. Yeah, I mean, was there an average? Or, a lot of it was very long. Oh, yeah, it was surprisingly long. And sometimes, and even today, what I found interesting is that in West Virginia, some people don't record their own deeds on property. And I think if Dennis can correct me, I don't think there's any. Is there a requirement to no, no, to, no law that says you have to record it. Yeah. Now, as a practical matter, one, the bank won't loan you money. Yeah. And two, your, your seller can sell it again. Yeah. You're, you're and that's why, I, that's why I know there's no requirement. Which, you know, if I, I get a deed and buy, buy to a land grant, I would have been first in line to the county clerk's office with a survey showing them, here's the property, I want my name on record. But that wasn't the case. And I, I think I was looking at some, some of the stuff that Jamie did over there, and she's doing excellent work on further than the index of this, taking a huge step further than the Sims index, by the signees within that land grants. It's incredible. You, it'd been signed, that one you showed me, what, three, four, five times. Mm -hmm. How did they break that down? Was it according to time served while she rank, or was there, uh, you know, an equation that they were I didn't see anything on equation. I'm sure. Oh, okay. For a registered war service, it was your rank. But um, colonial service was uh, issued here in Western Virginia. But Revolutionary War land grants are actually now in present day Ohio and Kentucky. Because we have to remember that the Northwest Territory yeah. was something that Virginia claimed. So the, the military warrants for the Revolutionary War are within the military Virginia District of Ohio and of the military Virginia District of Kentucky. Was that because all the land in present day West Virginia had already been? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. But I just wanted to because some. See, some would get 400 acres, another person may have gotten 600 acres. Yeah. And I wondered why, you know, the change. 400 was the standard. Yeah. And then it went up, and I guess at any point, as you said, the rank. We should point out we have undertaken a project to take SIMS index and expand upon it as a database yep. to make it more searchable to work in the assignees, the treasury warrant numbers for people who want to go back and see okay. out of this treasury warrant how many different people ended up with grants. It's going to be a long-term project, but it's, it's going to be very interesting. And I can tell you, we have already found quite a few names just in the first few counties that are not in SIMS. They oh, got sure. missed being indexed. So, you know, this is going to be a much more complete thing by the time we're finished, and it should play into if you're planning to put these up online. Yeah, I mean, we plan to make it available for the public, which is where it should be, quite honestly. I mean, the Virginia's information that is available online, and even today, I know it's a lot of the county clerks are putting their deeds online, birth certificate, uh, death certificate, wills, so forth, that have been through county clerk records. And that it makes it easier for the public, easier for lawyers to search the records, because you know, you can look a lot of stuff online without going to the actual courthouse if you can get into the court records. Also, right now, there's a lot of tax records online. Um, I think the vast majority, enough, all the shares have their tax records online. You can pay your taxes in, in most parts online. You can pay our office by a credit card online for certain items. Certain items you still are prohibited by state code. But we're trying to make it more user-friendly to the people of the state so they don't have to come to Charleston, they don't have to come to the local courthouse, they can do it online. And I think in the very near future you'll see a lot more of that on, on our website. Yes, sir. As a young man, I was told that George Washington owned a lot of land in Kanawha County. Was that through land grant? Yes, yes, and I think one of the land grants I picked, you can look at, 
I brought along the night is from George is from George Washington within the valley. Yeah, likewise with Daniel Boone. Yeah, you can go through the Sims Index and find George Washington's name, Daniel Boone's name. I believe Ruffner was another one. Um, it's been a while since I looked at <coughs> a lot of land grants. Or you can even look up my family name in there. You can find, when I looked up on the uh, Virginia site, I found probably half a dozen at least Rollisons that were given grants throughout the state. So it's quite interesting to go back and do that, really, find out what your family owned at one time. Or in some cases, what you didn't know. <laughs> but it, it's interesting. Yes, sir. I can add a few that might be of interest here in the Canal Valley. Mm -hmm. Your work probably wouldn't have taken uh, you to. Aaron Stockton, uh, who built the Glen Bears Inn, got 950 acres, including Canal Falls, mm -hmm. uh, for service in the War of 1812. He later acquired both the Cathedral Falls, now 125 additional acres. Wow. Uh, there was a grant from uh, Commonwealth, Virginia to George Washington and Andrew Lewis of 250 acres at the Burning Springs up here. It was on the Greenbrier River at that time. And uh, uh, that, that was a joint grant signed by the uh, Ran to George Washington and Andrew Wilson signed by Governor Thomas Jefferson yeah. of Virginia. And my wife and I found a deed. Uh, we're trustees on a religious organization. We sure like to sell it. Uh, but we found a deed from 1859. And I believe the name may have been Anderson. Union District of Clay County, mm -hmm. and uh, it was seven. The grant was made, and the grantee turned right around and sold the surface and retained the minerals. What year was that, sir? 1859. So they were doing it back then. <clears throat> wow. Well, somebody was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to think that far back in 1859 to think of doing that, that's pretty remarkable to me. Certain part of it for uh, agricultural usage. Is that all around Jamestown? Is it all? They spread out all over the Chesapeake Bay, except for Maryland. I really, I would say they spread out all over the state. You know how long that lasted for that company dissolved? Well, they dissolved. I mean, they got their license, I believe, in in 16, uh, 1606, in it expired there, and then they renewed it, and expired, I believe, in 1616, the lease, or what the, the company did. Yes, sir. Are you familiar with the Swan map? It's over, it's a, a, a lawyer's uh, offices there across uh, from the Embassy Suite. I forgot which law office it is. It's one, of, I think it's one of the originals, and then they're in the Library of Commerce. Commerce. I haven't recognized the name. I, ha I hadn't thought of it. They have a, they have a wall around the elevator. It's a huge, huge thing. But basically, it's land grants. It, they call yeah. it the, the coal fields of the greater Canal Valley by Swan. But it's broken down in the, into the land grants. And it's just it's a really neat, neat thing. And, uh, I can't remember. They did an article about it a few years ago. That's, that's was it Jackson? Is that? Maybe it's Jackson. No, I don't know. It's, it's right across from. 
Yeah. Lazy <coughs> cow. Yeah, that'd be. Um, it's a huge thing, and they discovered it, I guess, when somebody was leaving the farm. Oh, wow. I'll make a note of that. Thank you. It's available online. Yeah, there's a, I'll show you. Oh, you can have it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's pretty neat. That's a pretty useful instrument, then. <laughs> Is that for the whole state, too? No, that's just, just a call. Coal River and Davis Creek and St. Albans and Greater Corral Valley. Well, that'd be a useful, uh, be an interesting little project to do it for the whole state. <laughs> but the land grants. Be a good project for some college uh, geology or or uh, history. Wow, that'd be yes, sir. Uh, in digging around, I found a uh, reference to uh, 1609 transport to uh, Jamestown, and I'm curious as to whether that was a uh, Stolen transport, or possibly a criminal transport, <laughs> <laughs> because that was the way he got rid of some people and set up some land. Win win. <laughs> well, I thought they, I thought they all went to Georgia. When Georgia a penal colony? Yeah, that explains some. <laughs> That's interesting. Yes, sir. I'm just curious, in your reading, in that, that head right system that you said, yeah. actually, at least a part of it was that you got more acreage if you had slaves. Yes. So, is there any evidence that that resulted in people in trying to get acreage buying slaves? No, I, I don't have any. There was no reference I had that people would buy slaves in order to get more land. But that, that, that would not surprise me particularly, unfortunately, in a sad. Jamie? Could you speak a little bit on Junior Bank? Junior Bank, it basically came about really is similar to what we're doing now, I guess. Analogy is that right now, if you don't pay your taxes, we in turn sell your property. And, and essentially what Junior Grants were, if they didn't upheld their deal for the for the senior patents, the uh, state could go in and essentially re-give their land back. Their split, you know, they could split it up, and, make, and that's what they call the junior patents, the second patents. It, it's really, it seemed from my reading on it that it's not a whole heck of a lot of difference in what my office does across the state right now. You don't pay your real estate taxes, we'll offer it for sale. Hopefully the owner will come back and redeem it before the sale or after the sale, but if no one redeems it, we'll go ahead and deed it to the individuals that purchased it as sale during it or what we refer to as a more responsible owner, one that will pay the back taxes in order to improve the uh, property value, value, which is similar, I guess, to what you might say the junior patents were. Questions? Good question, but do you have internet access on that laptop? Yes, sir. You can look up historicmapworks.com and look at that map. Oh, I will. Yeah, but it'll just show you. You can ask. Okay, thank you, thank you. You know how to get You do better luck with it than I do. Historical. Uh, That's a remark. That's remarkable. Do they know who uh, compiled it? It's on the map. That's on the so, in eighteen. In eighteen. Uh, type in 
1867. There it is. Yeah, John S. George Washington. Um, yeah. If you can find the top right hand corner of the map, it's actually called the title map of the coal field. Oh, there's Samuel Smith, too. So it's actually showing who holds title to the land within the coal field. Wow. At that time. There he was. John right. and, and why was the map created? So a lot of lawsuits resulted from disputes between the owners at the time of those original, the people who at that snapshot in time uh, presumably owned those land grants. So this was a working out of exactly where those are. And if you look right there, you can see an overlap down there towards the bottom. Mm -hmm. And those would have been the subject of litigation. Right there? Yes. And, and, who, and who commissioned it? You'll see all kinds of coal mining areas because that was where the initial coal mining was taking place around the Coal River. You had to go over to the left. Yeah. We brought oh. our copy down. There's the mall. Yeah. And you, you'll really start seeing the names of coal mines and things. There are Daytona's on there and uh, Coal Mouth. And, but it starts getting a lot of colorful things. <laughs> Be interesting to know how many acres Samuel Smith got throughout the state. Sorry, Dick. <laughs> is that one here on the right? Yes. It says James Molinex. James Molinex and Paul. If you pull that over, that land ends up being part of Cardall State Forest. Wow. After transaction and transaction and transaction, uh, John C. Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury buys 4,000 acres and he becomes the first seller and a portion within that huge 92,000 acres, he ends up with 4,000 of that, like 20 to 30 years later. What, what I found interesting in that abstract that Mr. Ham did for that court case is all the name changes through the years, and even the switch of counties, properties switch between counties based upon the shifting of the margins of the property, which was remarkable to me. It just, I can't imagine how, how long it took, it took him to do that abstract on that piece of property. What I'm finding is some of the large land speculators had options on even more vast tracts of property which they assigned to others who actually got the grants. Yes. So the Henry Banks, the Samuel Smiths, the Dorsey Pentecosts, the, you know, those gentlemen had options on even larger tracts of land which they uh, sold their rights to others before they actually perfected those grants. Wow. So the total that they originally had options on would be far greater than what we would find if we added up everything that's since in. It's interesting if you look at some of those land grants, the 
meets and bounds they use the corners of the tree down by the river. <laughs> Now the problem is that river may change, and is it high mark, low mark? And that, I, a lot of that history is very unique, very interesting to me, reading it. Especially when I found some of my family members in there, and Daniel Boone, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, the Harrisons, Monroe. It's just remarkable that very few people even realize, I, I think, about these land grants within our state, which is... Hopefully, once we were able to make it on the line like Virginia is, more people will appreciate it and more historians will look at it and more land researchers will look at it and be able to appreciate it as much as we do here. And, and really, the people in this office does it, quite honestly, they're more suited to retain these land grants. Once, however, when we first had land grants years ago, we were on the second floor of the state capitol building. We had what we called a big vault. Some of you all can remember that. Dennis, I know, can remember it. <laughs> oh, we had a vault that was probably the length of this building almost that was filled with land records, land books, and we had these land grants. And people, we had room for people to come back, sit at the table, and look at the land books throughout. Unfortunately, due to the legislature wanting appropriating spaces, we were moved to the first floor of the state capitol. We had them for a while on the first floor, but unfortunately there was no room for people to look at them. So I suggested to the auditor, and he agreed that this place would be suited for them. They had more room, they had more expertise in this area than we did. So years ago, I, I, I don't even remember how long they've been here, Deborah. do you? Uh, I mean, I'm not too far behind you in terms of how long I've been with the state. I've had them for 15 to 20 years. Yeah, they've been over here, which is better suited because so you're able to use them over here and be able to view them. Yes, sir. I'm just going to mark that you can still see the water and patent lines on that map, on the type map today, if you get by a small scale and look at it. So the model and patent lines are still in use today. Really? Yeah, but I, I, I deal a lot with the tax maps today. I mean, a lot, a lot of those maps are available online now, so you can appreciate them. Pretty remarkable information. Kind of scary at times, too, what people can look at. <laughs> Google Map. I mean, that's, uh, have you tried putting them up on Google Map anyway? I But that's remarkable. You can look down and see your own house nowadays. <laughs> But if you t have an opportunity before you leave tonight, take a look at some of this stuff here, the, uh, especially that abstract that Mr. Hand did for that court case. I, I found extremely interesting. And if you have any questions, I'll be here for a while. Oh, yes, sir. It assumes that the index is still available for purchase through your office. Yes, we still have some copies left. I believe it's uh, 20 or $25. It's been a while since we sold one. We get the Sims index, and you also get the the supplement to the Sims Index, which was the uh, land grants that were in West Virginia. And if you can look at this and you can see there, uh, these were, I think most of these were land grants they found that are in the Virginia counties that are now in West Virginia. Yeah. You have to know the county and then you can find the name. Several years ago, we offered, well, it needs to say how old this is. The uh, copyright has expired. <laughs> so there have been, uh, I know that one organization re redid it years ago. Was it that long? Yes. It's been a while. In, there's another index I'm sure you, you guys are familiar with. I just know the name. I don't know if I've ever seen it called Dwar's Index. We used to, even, even the warehouse, we still have it at the warehouse. We had them on the, these land grants on index cards to search for them. But, but like anything else, we don't have 
it's still the even the index cards are based first upon uh, county and then alphabetical order within the county sorted that way at that point right now we have not had any opportunity to index that electronically which would be a great use So I can be able to index by name. So somebody can search by name. Oh, that'll be quite useful. They're already doing a great deal of service for us right now. And they also have some of our old land books. And, and we owe a lot of this, our old copies that, that we have right now to the Mormons who came through years ago before I started working here and made microfilm copies. So we have microfilm copies of, of a lot of our old old land books and old land records, but we uh, switched the we're switching though the imaging copies. We have a lot of our records imaged, and, and shortly we'll be putting a lot more out on the internet for people to look at. Well, I thank you all very much for coming. I, I hope I said some like, not a whole lot. As I said, I'm not an expert on this. <laughs>